All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our March 8th. We are nine days away from St. Patrick's Day edition of Bull Sessions. My name is Mark Robertson. I am joined here by Ken Kabula. Good afternoon, Ken. Good afternoon, Mark. Good afternoon, everybody in the audience. Uh, it's a beautiful day here. It's sunshiny, blue sky. Uh, glad you're with us. And it is it is a very difficult uh, time in the news and watching the stock market. It's quite turbulent. Uh, Nick DiVirgilio says he likes to come here for a little bit of sunshine. I don't know if it's the 12 inches of sunshine that Herb was talking about, but uh, uh, you do have to be an optimist to be an investor, really, I, I believe. And uh, we'll do the best we can. All right, so we'll touch on a couple of things. This Armageddon theme is just a kind of a poke at uh, – you know, all these people that think the world is about to end and that somehow has something to do with an investing strategy. I, I don't know about that. Um, I am going to encourage us to all be arborists, and I'll explain that here in a few minutes. As shown down there at the bottom, uh, these days are not kind to Groundhog Nation. I think that's an understatement, Ken. <laughs> is that a hand in the air saying stop, Mark? Is that what that is? I think that's a Groundhog no mas. Because <laughs> he's leave me alone, right? <laughs> down for at least one of the counts, and then we're gonna, we'll uh, spend a little bit of time talking about workhorses and setting the stage for doing some stuff with St. Louis, and of course that annoying chimp will be there. But that's basically the stuff we'll cover here today. Any comments or questions before we get officially underway, Ken? No, I'm ready to get get to it, Mark. All right, so let's go ahead and give our boilerplate reminder no investment recommendation whatsoever is intended this is about education it's about a demonstration of the philosophies methods and techniques of the modern investment club movement when it comes to stock analysis and the design and maintenance of portfolios you're gonna basically see some illustrations or discussions about influential topics um, they will be our opinions our interpretations Please do your own homework before making an investment decision. If we own something, we'll try to remember to uh, admit that as we go through. Our monthly roundtable, which is a few weeks away, uh, March 29th is the next one. They're generally held on the last Tuesday of the month, 8.30 Eastern Time. If you'd like to be added to a reminder list about that event, uh, send an email to annkabula1 at comcast.net. If you have any other follow-up, including Q&A or suggestions for future topics, uh, our two email addresses are on display there at the bottom of the page. Anything else you'd like to add to that, Ken? No, uh, the uh, guest list uh, seems to be working really well for us right now. Uh, uh, Natalie is getting a, a nice steady stream of people when they change their email, their starting to remember to notify here about that folks if you do change your email we have no way of knowing you did that uh, unless you notify us so if you want to keep getting reminders and they've suddenly stopped uh, it might be because you're using a new email address just drop a line to myself I'll make sure my wife gets it and we can make that change pretty easily then on the guest list okay well, I made a slight change. I'm going to basically keep the bullpen in the manifest form, so our future topics will drive from there. But uh, couldn't resist getting out the chimp here, Ken, as you'll see here in a second. Got to tell you, I was going to put the the groundhog update at the end of the session, along with the best small companies, and they they just bubbled back to the top. And uh, this, of course, is a reference to uh, a number of sessions we did last summer. Uh, talking about the dart throwing chimp at Graham Stephan's uh, webcast series, and uh, where he he basically took on that that annual article about chimpanzees throwing darts and all that kind of good stuff, and we added him to this year's Groundhog, and we may re we may come to regret that. <laughs> you know, if if he makes if he makes 167 of us look silly. This could be an uncomfortable moment, you know, down the road here. So well, then we're going to be talking about long-term results. Remember, <laughs> we're long-term investors, Mark, okay? Okay, but here is the, the standings as of today. Quite a few people here in the audience are on this list. I am not. Again, I am not. Uh, I happened to 
hope for an earlier turnaround in the NASDAQ, and that's not happening yet. But from uh, top to bottom, we do have kind of an invasion of the rhinos, the institutional accounts up at the top of the list that are in italics. I did add the number of previous championships in the form of asterisks to the slides. So you can see down there at number 11, Andrew Spector was the champion, individual champion a couple of years ago. So he gets an asterisk. And of course, uh, Warren Buffett was the, the number, uh, the institutional champion for the trailing year, and he's a two-time champion as an institution. But there's a, a number of names that have lived up near the top. Um, Herb Lemkul is back up at the top at number 14. I didn't know. I think Herb deserves an asterisk too, doesn't he, Mark? Well, his club, he gets one for a club for sure. You know, oh, I thought he was on the individual list too. Maybe not. No, but Northern Traders is missing an asterisk, so I'll make sure I rectify that. Okay. But, uh, a whole bunch of names on here. Norm Badger Chemnitzer is on the list. Um, Larry Dix out of Cleveland. Um, Nick, I thought Nick D was on here, but he's got to be close. I know he's close. So uh, just some different names on here for a change from top to bottom. But the, the major news for the last week, by the way, we were at about minus 4% seven days ago. And the average result now has sunk to minus 12. Um, ow. That's what I mean by no mas. And we went from half of our participants beating the market to back down around 20%. Uh, I don't know about you, Ken, but I'm getting a little tired of that. Uh, <laughs> Kathy, Kathy Wood went from 140th to 80th and back to 160th. So uh, quite, quite volatile times for innovative companies. And as Ken likes to point out, Many of her companies don't have earnings, so that makes her extra vulnerable in um, these times. Anything jump off the list that you can? Well, only that uh, th this is a short-term contest, and we're kind of watching it uh, much more closely than I ever used to watch this particular contest. So um, – I just have to remind myself that uh, my portfolios are what's important, not the contest, <laughs> and uh, try to try to make sure that my portfolios are hitting my own personal goals. Uh, I, I'm not, I, you know, I used to think it was really strange when you interviewed uh, Olympic champions and they said, uh, I was only playing against myself or skating against myself or running against myself. Uh, but I, I, I do think that's true when you get to a place where you've been doing a, something for a long time. Uh, I want my portfolios to hit marks that I set for myself, and I don't necessarily look at benchmarks coming from outside my own uh, thought process anymore. So uh, I'm older, I'm wiser, and uh, more conservative now as far as my investing is concerned. Uh, I'm I'm just not going to take uh, very many chances in Ardellics or any other ones like that anymore, Mark. So, all right. Well, you brought it up. I mean that that is the number <laughs> one performing stock at the roundtable after just a couple of weeks, going from seventy-two cents to a dollar. Um, <laughs> right. After and mind you, and many in the audience already know this. I was not allowed to put it in the audience poll that night. Well, you. You know, you, you, you've labeled me the rock on tour, so I'll tell you a really quick story about <laughs> the stock contest that we used to run at the high school level. It was a short-term contest, and uh, it was managed by three of my social studies teachers, and one of the guys uh, who I really respected as a teacher and, and as a person, uh, but he didn't have a whole lot of investing experience. Uh, one of the guys was convinced he was a great poker player and a great card player in general. He was convinced that the best way to make money in the market was to buy the cheapest stocks because then they only had to move a nickel or a dime or something like that to to make a lot of money. And after he tried that strategy for three or four years and, and didn't come close to even making the, the the list of the top 500 in the country, uh, he decided that that was a terrible idea. So uh, maybe we have to 
to hold your hand and 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 remind <laughs> you that that uh, for everyone that that makes it in that in that penny stock area right there, there's quite a few that don't. So. Well, I, I hear you, and I'm 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 licking my wounds gently and trying to learn the experience. <laughs> and uh, I do want to come back to George Mackey. He's at number two here. He's he's our our hope for right now. Um, and George actually gave a very uh, compelling explanation of just what you were talking about with the Olympic uh, athletes, of how he you know he's not out to necessarily win this contest year in year out but he wants to pick solid stocks and generate solid long-term results. And he certainly is doing that. So it's good to see him up at the top of the list. All right, let's keep going. Again, this was going to be at the end, but I felt compelled to bring it to the front. Um, again, we're, we're lagging the market with our best small companies for this year. We don't generally track this close. In fact, Ken has often historically conf uh, accused me of jinxing us. <laughs> potentially Jason, this is because we're not supposed to watch it this close. I don't know. I'm kind of a, of the mindset now that it doesn't matter which seat in the living room I sit in as to how the align I do on the basketball court. You know, there are people that think if you move across the room, you can change the luck on the screen. Uh, I think this stuff happens with or without us, Ken. So it's okay I, to watch. I I kind of think so also, but <laughs> I, I still don't like it when people talk about some of these things right before the decisions are going to be made. It just always seems that that uh, maybe you just remember the times where it happened much more vividly than the times when it didn't. Well, it, 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 there's a difference between reporting it as fact or, and celebrating early. When I celebrated early in September a year ago, I trimmed 40% off the top. Uh, over the next couple of weeks. So I know, I think I understand the difference. Anyhow, um, took your suggestion, Ken, to put the, the Russell 2000 in as a comparison. And uh, wow, thank you. Here's, here's your chance to expound. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just waiting for you to go on further here. Uh... Yeah, it, it just simply underscores what I did is I took the, the portfolio. That orange bar over at the right. Yeah, you, well, Go ahead, Ken. Well, I, I think it shows that we're picking some of the better stocks from the small growth category. Uh, but uh, I'm I'm always been watching since you began this graphic, the red and the blue, obviously. And, um, you know, it's one stock. So I don't know how much management we're doing at this particular uh, time, this particular point. Uh, I guess we have a couple of others that are are kind of bouncing around down there at at twenty or better uh, negative relative return, and at some point, I think we're going to have to make some decisions about those if we're going to continue to to keep the philosophy uh, going. We have a twenty nine in there too, don't we? Negative twenty nine yeah. for Fulgent. Yeah, yeah. And that I don't think the story there has changed much. I think we're just seeing quite a bit of turbulence in the market uh the the company that was well first of all our pick of pachira to replace e-health what turns out to be uh quite a good decision and and places that blue bar ahead of the red bar or the maroon bar whatever color that is but i also wanted to point out that gentherm which had been handily leading this leaderboard uh hit a speed bump and we'll talk about that in a second but you know your your suggestion to put the russell 2000 on here and I did limit it to growth to take out again that reminder that small company, small cap, and small company are not the same thing. And I thought it was more pertinent or relevant to compare us to the Russell 2000 growth, trying to avoid some of the distressed merchandise that's in the the Russell 2000 small cap. So interesting stuff there. Here's what's going on, at least from anything that I can find. There's very little in the financial press about Den Gentherm other than this, which is actually several days old. But uh, it's actually taken quite a dip. You can see from the price chart on the upper right, back around Halloween, we got into it around 70-ish. It got up to 90-something, almost to 100. And in uh, just a few days, it's dropped back to 65-ish. I think it was 67 today. And this is the only article I was able to find, Ken, right on the heels of them having a blowout successful uh, fourth quarter. 
mid-February. So uh, they're certainly not alone in impact from Russia. But uh, yeah, I think just the fact that they let off this list probably didn't help them a whole lot. I still like the story a lot. Well, we'll have to keep our, our eyes open. I'll, I'll admit to not following that list as closely as as I maybe should, uh, but at the same time, I, I kind of want to see what it does over over time. I'm I'm not necessarily going to panic about the the ups and downs over one month versus another. So, yeah, and what I did witness is a number of rhinos, including Renaissance and several other leading mutual funds and hedge funds, all kind of dumping on Gentherm and getting out of it, and that's probably caused a, a lot of what we're seeing here, this price drop right here. Oh, well. All right. I already had this one in the presentation, and then Matt Spielman actually put it on the forum today. I was a little bit skittish about bringing it, in, bringing it up because it's kind of stark, but uh, this is a reality. I mean, there, there's, there's some really weird... I'm going to use a highly scientific technical phrase, crap, going on right now. And uh, it, it's just a different way of saying something that we've said all along is the way I see it, Ken. Well, Mark, ever since you showed me this slide, I've been searching my mind trying to think, where did I just hear this in the last week? And one of the guys that I kind of respect from uh, CNBC said something very similar to this last Thursday or Friday. It was Josh Brown, uh, who manages uh, money and is on the, I think it's called the closing bell. Yeah. Uh, uh, with, uh, well, it's called the closing bell with a, a number of other uh, analysts, some of them uh, uh, should be listened to, by the way. But I, but I think that that this view certainly makes logical sense. It might not make emotional sense, but it makes logical sense. I think. Yeah, and it's it's that we've been on this theme for a few weeks. Uh, don't stop what you're doing. Keep doing what you're doing. If if anything else, double down on the discipline. And. Uh, because trust me, if, if those rockets start flying around, um, it, it's not going to be our portfolios that we're concerned about is, is generally the way to look at it. So keep doing what you're doing. Keep pressing on. And that's kind of what I wanted to cover here for a few minutes. If you'll just uh, indulge me a little bit. I've actually received a number of letters that are kind of in. People are intrigued by this chart that we've thrown up a few times and displayed. Uh, during these sessions, certainly a few times it manifests. Some people actually write to me and ask for it to be added to the weekly update occasionally. And I thought we'd just spend a little bit of time talking about this notion of timing the market and characterizing the market. I want to focus in on those leaves. And uh, I'm, I'm going to go through it. I'll try to slow down. But if you want more on this subject, these two articles down at the bottom, including the actual original piece from the interview by... Um, in fact, that's Joshua Brown's colleague, Barry Ritholtz, um, in his interview of Paul Desmond of Lowry's. And then there's an, a more extensive discussion. This actually goes back to, uh, I think, 2010 or 2011. Uh, that's a post in the Manifest Forum. And if you're not a Manifest subscriber and you want access to that, just send me an email and I'd, I'll help you out. But uh, uh, the thing that the point that he was making here as he was talking with Barry is about how the stock market has this natural ebb and flow to it. We all know this to be true. We know that small, medium, and large companies kind of take their turns leading the dance. And uh, uh, and that's what these guys were covering as they talked about this issue. And here they were talking about the ability to call market tops or the inverse market bottoms. And uh, again, the, this Paul Desmond you know, it's one of those moments that kind of stuck with me of this, this notion of leaves falling and autumn hitting and the, the dramatic change of color that we see here in northern Michigan every autumn. And, uh, and, and what you're basically looking at is a way to kind of interpret that to the stock market. Now, I'm not a great fan of technical analysis, no matter what Ken tries to make you believe. Um, 
I mean, I don't spend a lot of time with this stuff. In fact, most of the time my cues, you know, technical charting as being a form of trying to read chicken scratches in the barnyard or something like that. But the thing that I do think is legitimate, there's a couple things that are legitimate with technical analysis, and that is this notion of uh, trying to gauge the sentiment of the herd. It's kind of a psychiatric slash psychological condition, almost behavioral. And uh, humans are involved in the stock market. So you're going to have psychological elements and behavior type elements to it. And that's just something that you just have to accept. And so when, uh, you know, stocks are one of those few things that people tend to chase, performance chase. And then when the stock price drops dramatically, we think we don't, whereas in many cases, the first thing that should come to your mind is, you know, if, if that coat that you were interested in in the grocery store the the retail store last week was a hundred dollars and now it's 40 i you know with a coat you're more interested with a stock you you basically back off say well what's wrong with it and so there's there's tremendous emotions that don't always make intuitive sense in the stock market so what you see here is the work by this paul desmond uh and a, a few other technical chartists that is basically trying to measure that herd mentality over time. So what, what they basically graph is they take the stocks that are on the New York Stock Exchange and they take the total number of stocks making new highs. And then they subtract the number of companies making new lows. And they come up with the points which are shown by the uh, maroon and the green area areas up at the top here. And the blue line through it all is just simply a moving average. It's a 12-month moving average just to kind of smooth it out and show the trend of what's happening over time. Now, in the background, you've got the, the Wilshire. Well, I think this is the S&P 500. The S&P 500 is, is on display here in the background. And so what you're looking at going back to 2004, including one of the worst episodes in stock market history right here. And what I want to draw your attention to is the behavior of that blue line over time. And again, think seasons, think cycles, whatever makes sense to you. Uh, they zig and they zag. They bounce around. And the only time it really starts getting uh, serious or, you know, a downward sentiment is when you have these situations in these yellow areas that are here. See how these are bouncing off, bouncing off. There's a little bit of yellow here. Um, kind of a nasty moment there in March 2020. That was basically the second worst time in the last 20 or 30 years. And then where are we today? Well, we're we're kind of approaching the point where it's at least as bad as what we saw two years ago. So that's kind of the, the frame that I want to leave you with right now, that this yellow area, it's it's not to be ignored. Something's going on there. Okay. And here's the actual presentation. Mark, yeah, before you leave that, could we point out two things? Because I, I think there are maybe some people that are struggling a little bit with the graphic. Okay. Uh, right there above the arrow that you drew on the left, uh, the um, the lighter line crosses the axis. Uh, would that mean that right at that particular place, uh, the number of highs balanced out exactly the number of lows? Yeah, when it hits zero, yeah, the yeah. number the number of new highs is basically equal to the number of new right. Lows. So, so if we move into the green areas, we're not saying there aren't any new lows. We're just saying that there's fewer new lows than there are new highs, right? That's correct. And the reverse is true in the red area, then that there are fewer new highs than there are new lows, then. Right. Okay, and then you talked about the S&P underlying the graph. Uh, I think you're referring to that really light blue shaded stuff that begins right where you just drew that arrow, right there, exactly. So the S&P kept moving up, uh, but this, this uh, index or this idea turned over uh, sort of as the S&P peaked. Right, so we'll, we're going to take a closer look at that here. Because it really is not quite as intuitive as you you think. On the far right, you've got what, what is shown up here, and this is Lowry actually talking to a, a room full of uh, institutional investors, and uh, 
he basically asked them the question, what percentage of stocks would you expect to be making new highs at the top of the bull market? You know, and as, as we're watching the bull markets proceed, and we certainly have had a, a wonderful 10-year run since uh, around uh, 2012, uh, what percentage would you expect to be making new highs at the top of the bull market? And so he said, he basically said to the attendees in the audience, what about 80%? And he said, a lot of hands went up. How about 70%? And then, then still some a slightly smaller set of hands went up. How about 60? You know, fewer hands. But basically everybody had their hands up at 50 or above. And then he said, well, what would you believe if I told you it was 6%? In other words, as the stock market makes brand new highs, only 6% of the companies are hitting new highs. And you go back and look at this all the way back to the Great Depression, which I don't typically do. I usually stop in the 40s, but we'll do it here. 14 major market tops, the average percentage of stocks making new highs on that day was 6%. And that's, uh, I think that's counterintuitive. It certainly was to the professionals in that particular room. So again, he's encouraging them to think about this notion of falling leaves. Here's a look at uh, another variation of that theme that uh, he uses a five-day compilation. He actually adds a five to the end of this, but it's the same. We're actually looking at the same thing. And the thing you want to take away here is, you know, these peaks are hitting, you know, up here well before the market starts taking off and going down. I mean, this is, this is a period of, you know, six to eight weeks here before the market starts slumping. And in our current situation, we actually had that peak back around Halloween of last year in terms of companies hitting new highs. By the time we hit the real market peak up here, look where we're already at. So again, this thing tends to top out uh, well in advance of the market actually sagging. Okay, so here's that look again, same type of thing. And one of the reasons I bring it up is I have had some uh, discussions with a few of you offline about something I did a few months ago where you thought I might have lost my mind a little bit with tin cup. I was looking at this chart at that time and I was noticing this situation. Again, these peaks were being put in. This is going in the wrong direction. The, the blue line at the time was going in the wrong direction. Market peak had still not been hit. And back at that time frame, you can go back and look. Uh, I basically did a major house cleaning with the tin cup portfolio. And the reason I did did it was at least strongly influenced by this chart. I went in and I said, you know what? If I've got anything that in here that is that feels marginal with respect to quality or financial strength, I'm going to subject that to a, a strenuous uh, or an assertive analysis and and uh, basically get rid of the stuff that is lower, you know, a little bit lower quality or a little bit more speculative perhaps, and basically try to guard myself for what might lie ahead. Now, I, I can't time the market. I don't know anybody who can. But what I can do is look at these type of conditions and without making any major change, going to always be investing regularly, but back during that time frame while screening, and you've heard us talk about this in the past, when Cy Lynch talks about ratcheting up financial strength requirements for his uh, stock screens, that sort of thing, this is what was part of what was influencing or driving that. Does that make any sense at all to you, Ken? It makes a lot of sense to me, Mark. And uh, I guess the, the other thing that makes a, an awful lot of sense, um, uh, and I'm going to take an aside first before I make my point. Okay. And the aside is that the tin cup, by its very nature, is designed to be a uh, a portfolio managed behind the tax screen. And this strategy might not work as well for a portfolio that's sitting in front of the tax screen. In other words, where you would have to pay immediate capital gains tax mm -hmm. on on a capital gains and everything. So uh, I, I think it's it's important for us to say that Tin Cup uh, is a uh, is mimicking contributions into uh, tax deferred accounts, and therefore you don't have a tax situation to to worry yourself too much about. But what I think uh, is nice about this is that it's not so precise that it tells you to pull a trigger at a certain time, 
but it, it does have a certain visual appeal to it. Uh, I'm looking back before all of these peaks and, and you see these green lines come down to higher highs and uh, lower lows. Uh, and then you see the underlie, the, the light blue part, uh, you see it making enough of a downturn uh, that you say to yourself, it's happened. Uh, I would have a hard time understanding downturns if they weren't significant enough, but these are happening in pretty significant downturns for you not to make a mistake about. Yeah, and the, the other thing on the flip side of what I just had to say, back during this time frame when we had actually had a fairly rapid recovery back to the levels of 2008, um, you know, I say rapid now, but it was a period of actual years we'd snap back a little bit. But, um, the, you know, if you went on to CNBC or read any type of financial media back in that time frame, there was a whole lot of concerns, especially back in during this time frame. Uh, about a, another really bad recession or whatever happening. And I will tell you absolutely that uh, I was looking at this section right here um, saying, you know, in, in fact, counseling family members to stay, basically you know, turn off the TV, get back in there, invest regularly, buy excellent companies at excellent prices, ignore them. I don't see cause for concern for that multi-year period when that blue line was just chugging away. And look what happened to the market during that time frame. There were so many people saying run for the hills. Every time this thing got down here around zero, it just, again, the longer term trends matter. Again, you don't do anything dramatically different. What we're going through right now is uh, relatively material compared to the last 20 years. Now, Mark, do we get a data point every 12 months or do we get a data point every month looking back 12 months well they, they can be pretty much continuous uh there there's actually well, daily charts on this the, one has a this one has a 20 on it uh on the ema and the other mm -hmm. one has a 12 on it can you interpret for the audience what the 20 and the 12 mean well this one here is it's more short term you're looking more at uh at, at daily numbers and you're focused in on a shorter time frame. So here you're looking back at a 25 day period. So basically a, a quarterly rolling average. Whereas here, these are annual because these are monthly numbers. And because it's a, it's a ro the rolling average, the trailing average is 12. It's a one year rolling average. Trailing so average. every month we get a, a data point. On this particular chart, back, yes. yes. On this chart. And it's looking back 12 months every month, okay? Mm -hmm. So, again, nothing to, nothing terribly dramatic. But, again, if you go back and look at the changes I made, we actually exited six or seven positions and attempted to position ourselves carefully for, you know, what could be happening now. And with all that said, you still have to keep things in context. And I know this is one of Ken's favorite slides. This is the value line arithmetic index monthly going back to the about the turn of the century and yeah we're going to always have moments in the stock market what i find kind of fascinating because this has been a year not to enjoy but it hasn't exactly been a fairly dramatic uh, drop yet from where it's been and then i'll make one last point before turning it back to ken this relative strength index up to the top again we're talking months here months so it's a 12 month trailing average anytime that we've seen these type of moments again our counsel has always been when you have one of those don't be surprised if this happens or if this happens ultimately or if this happens ultimately these these drop downs those not those aren't exactly surprises because the market you know again it's like you know Rather than watch the market, watch the leaves and watch for the opportunities for a good bonfire with the leaves. So that's kind of what we're, we're saying here. And so, again, this last year, even though it's been kind of a gut-wrenching, um, the point can be made that we really have not had that massive a drop yet, despite all the, all the 
people wringing their hands on the on the TV tube. Well, the the perspective of the market, Mark, has been so channeled uh, in the last 12, 14 months compared to what it has historically done. Uh, I listened to statistics uh, two nights ago that uh, basically indicated that uh, on an average year, the S&P has at least one drop of 14% uh, from its high, uh, whatever that high happens to be. And uh, up until uh, about three weeks ago, uh, we had not come close to a 14% drop uh, for about 14 months. Uh, we're just as of the beginning of the day yesterday, and yesterday was a, a down day. Today's a little bit, or at least it was a little bit of an up day when I got on the program here. Uh, we had still not hit that 14% number as a drop. We were at 13%. Uh, on the S and P, so uh, I I think that this perspective is basically telling us, you know, how far away from historic places are you, and you got to keep that in mind. Uh, I I just hated the the people on television that were telling me uh, to be really careful when we were sitting four percent off of all time records on all of the. Uh, the measures that you can take of the market. So uh, I, I don't think that we've seen the worst of it yet. Uh, and I don't think it's really been as bad as it feels right now. What I think feels so bad are these wild swings uh, in a matter of hours uh, going from down 400 to up 700 and things like that. I think that's what gives your stomach a churning. Uh, and then to have a madman over in, in a foreign country uh, threatening to put his nuclear uh, weapons on, on a high alert uh, doesn't add to the comfort zone. So I, I, I still think patience and discipline Maybe we'll add perspective and context to the list of vocabulary words that you need to have uh, as an investor. But above all, I think patience and a little bit of discipline mm -hmm. will serve you well. And one of the things I can't help but notice is we actually went back to double digit projected annual returns on average for the first time in a very long time here yep. recently. So it's still only at 10%. Yep, yep, that that's another number, the MIPAR number that 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 I I like to follow. Uh, I mean, people get all excited when MIPAR is down at seven, but but you know when it's down at seven that the market is a little bit ahead of itself. Uh, just as you know when it's up at fifteen or eighteen that the market is is providing you with opportunity. Uh, when it's down around nine, ten, eleven, uh, that's a that's a good solid average market. Don't don't be so so quick to panic. I guess that's the way to say it. And I guess in just closing thought, I'll repeat something I already said. Uh, don't be looking at the trees swaying in the wind. We we watch. We don't watch markets. We watch individual companies for opportunity, and they're the yep. leaves. And the leaves, it's just a fact of life. The leaves turn from green to beautiful ch shades of maroon and orange, and and they fall to the ground and they become opportunities. And then occasionally a tree like EPAM gets really sick for a reason completely beyond its control. Uh, maybe you add meta platforms to that too, uh, but that that's the exception rather than the rule. Mm -hmm. And what's not to like about meta platforms? Um, <laughs> okay, moving right along. Speaking of platforms, I really like this one, Ken. Um, again, coming back to our notion of, yeah, shop for the individual leaves and watch for them to be autumnal in color. Um, but yeah, this is a kind of my lifetime of investing on full display here, going back to the early 1990s. And uh, we're basically tracking the S&P 500. That's what SPX is. That's the S&P 500. The mid is the medium sized or the mid cap uh, S and P 400 stocks, and small is the S and P 600. And uh, I think the graph kind of speaks for itself. 
Uh, there's a reason that we counsel investing in small, medium, and large. And again, Ken and I always wrestle over those are really not the right way to think of it. But uh, that is the way that Wall Street, they do categorize by market cap. Um, but just this general notion of having enough smaller and workhorse companies in your portfolio uh, with the awareness that those two, those two arrows, one being the Great Recession of 2008, 2009, and then whatever that was that happened in March of last year, two years ago now, um, yeah, the, the smaller and medium-sized companies do get hammered disproportionately during those times. That's the other reason that I did what I did with 10 Cup. Well, it's a good slide to pull out, Mark, when, when you're explaining simple methodology and when you say to people, you know, keep half of your portfolio in these good, solid, mid-sized uh, workhorse kind of companies. They're going to serve you well. Uh, and in fact, they're going to serve you counterintuitively, maybe even a little bit better than the average smaller company, which is why when you're picking small companies, you have to be highly selective and ask for them to perform just as you would ask uh, a large company to perform as far as consistency is concerned. I also think the slide does a wonderful job of explaining why Nobody can really tell you what the historical return on the market is until you give them a good solid definition of what you mean by the market. Uh, I mean, when we say we think the market has grown historically between 9 and 11 percent, well, here's your numbers. Here's your backup for the whole thing right here. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's as close uh, when you're drawing with crayons, that's as close as you're going to be able to come for a historical market average. It also underscores over a period of 30, approximately 30 years, the massive difference that 2% makes. Notice yep. that the difference between the orange bars and the blue bars is only 2% per year. And take a look at where this is at versus this. Now, the bottom one's good. The orange one up there is really good. So yeah, so again, this is why we obsess over having a portfolio that's diversified by growth, um, no doubt about it. And in fact, that's a pretty good segue. Can't already mention the workhorses. We are putting together a special edition of the roundtable, uh, working in concert with the St. Louis community of investors. Uh, so the April roundtable, which is approximately seven weeks away now, We'll uh, include some St. Louis content, probably some Clydesdale stuff. I'll see if I can't get Budweiser to give us a Super Bowl commercial, maybe, Ken. <laughs> if, if you're sitting in the audience and you uh, are involved with one of our chapters throughout the country, uh, give me a, a, a note if you'd like to advertise this special edition. We'll send you uh, the... Uh, copy for what we're going to be putting in our email to our members. Uh, we'll I'll send you the copy for what we're going to be putting on our website. Uh, we can't send to your members, unfortunately, and we can't put on your website, unfortunately, but we can send you the copy we're going to use and you can uh, change it at will and put it on, on your website. Uh, if this works out, uh, and the, the general organization will be that we're going to have a, a, a class of some sort from 7.30 Eastern to 8.20 Eastern. Uh, and then we're going to take a, a short break. And then at 8.30, the normal roundtable will come on. And uh, one of our guests at that normal roundtable will be somebody from the guest chapter. Uh, helping us to present stocks and to discuss what, what it is we discuss at roundtables. It's a slight change in format, but essentially the, the good old roundtable is still there, uh, but we're going to add some, some uh, uh, a little bit of time to get a little bit more in detail about some of our favorite topics, and we're going to do that before the roundtable uh, happens. 
uh, for about 50 minutes. If that interests you and your chapter might like to help us out with something like that or, or become involved with it, uh, send me an email and we can talk about other months and, and other things that you might like to discuss. But I'm really excited about this, as is the, the uh, contacts from St. Louis. Uh, and uh, I, I think that we're going to put together something that uh, can be duplicated a, a couple different times in a couple different ways with a number of different groups throughout the country. And I, I think it's a perfect backdrop uh, for, you know, the Clydesdales and the workhorses and that previous slide, because, you know, you tune into CNBC, all you hear about is the S&P 500 and those blue chip large caps that are out there. And then, of course, we spend a lot of time talking about the other end of the spectrum with the smaller, faster growing companies. Uh, lo and behold, and I'll go back one slide, uh, those guys in the middle, the, they're basically ignored um, by much of what we do. Uh, I think this is an opportunity to, uh, you know, give them their day in the sun, so to speak. So, Especially since Nicholson said this is where half of your money should go. Yeah. You know, yeah. especially since he makes that that direct point that put half of your money here. Mm -hmm. uh, it's that's powerful. That's really powerful coming from somebody that I really respect. All right. So in that vein, just thought I would tinker a, a little bit because uh, we actually come at this notion of small, faster growing, medium sized workhorses and the larger blue cap. Uh, stalwarts in a slightly different way and, and the dimensional approach that we we take is to pursue quality in, in that in that group along with uh, growth we want to have enough growth in the portfolio and we want to basically be looking over the shoulders of people who have demonstrated what they're doing so what you see here is a collection of seven growth funds we're featuring uh, one of the better ones right now Vanguard Technology, which is the tech sector fund. Um, going back 10 years in performance, we're talking about a portfolio that's composed of companies growing at 10 to 11 percent, but with exceptional quality. And that, that's, that, that's the key factor that I went looking for in this chart, along with really decent return characteristics. And again, this notion of all, all seven of these have beaten the market over the, the time frame shown, most of them 10 years. And this is a real decent uh, set of uh, qualifiers here. How powerful can it be? Uh, I, I got to tell you, I look back with great fondness that this was my father's largest holding in his uh, personal uh, retirement fund. And what it did over the last, he held it since the beginning of this chart. And, you know, and basically what happened here is quite special. So again, that's underscoring what we were showing back a few slides ago about, uh, you know, not just diversification by size, but yes, a diverse, diversification by size, but also with emphasis on the proper growth rates and quality uh, characteristics. And um, wow, this, this, for me, this really makes the point. You're looking at the VFINX, which is the S&P 500, that's in black down here at the bottom, versus this VGT, the Van, Vanguard Technology Sector, which as Ken was telling me before we came online that some analysts are declaring the tech sector to be dead, apparently. Fair statement? I, a very fair statement, and, and she made no bones about it. She, she said that the place for investing uh, was not in tech in the next 10 years, it was industrials. And uh, I, I, I don't know, I, I can't buy that argument. I need more data, I need more well, uh, uh, much more thought put into it than just a, a soundbite on CNBC. As, as I said earlier, Ken, uh, does that mean that tech, tech was dead in March 2020 or in November 2019 or 2018, whatever that was? Uh, I'm, I'm not buying it either. I think it's a component of life going forward and uh, interesting set of companies. So one of the things I thought we would do is just kind of take a look at, well, what are these top performing, high quality funds uh, interested in these days. There's a couple kind of interesting names on here. Ivy Science and Technology, that one right down the middle, that do does happen to come with a load, but I think you can avoid it in, in certain accounts. Jensen is the poster child for quality, although it's slipped a little bit here in recent years and lagged a little bit performance-wise, but still pretty good over the long term. I was stunned 
I think for the second time in at least six months to see Magellan on here. Uh, Fidelity Magellan actually doing a pretty nice job. And of course the exchange traded fund at the Motley Fool churning out pretty decent results over there, a little bit relatively shorter time frame, but they think very much like we do. So it's always interesting to see what's in there. So what I did is I basically took each one of these funds. This one actually happens to be Vanguard Technology. And it's a pretty good shopping list of companies and com I own many of these companies directly, but also own shares of VGT. And VGT is something I would not be afraid, despite what Ken said about the the talking head on TV, uh, I'm not uh, skittish about owning this one either and accumulating this one while it, while it apparently dies. All right, so pretty good stuff from top to bottom. And then what I did is I went into each of the seven and went looking for the two or three favorites, either in most widely held for the exchange traded funds or the funds actually, the, the mutual funds that you see here, what are they actually buying lately? And put together this list, which I think is a fairly decent shopping list. Those seven quality, high growth, high quality funds with solid 10 year track records generates this list of current interest. And uh, I, I think I would be um, okay with shopping here. Your thoughts, Ken? Uh, absolutely. I, I, I think before uh, we started today, uh, I counted up and, and I happen to own nine out of the 20 on the list. Uh, it's, a, it's a great set of stocks, both from a stock study uh, point of view, uh, but also I think there's quite a bit of diversity on this list, even though they're all called tech stocks, Mark. Uh, there, you're, you're going in a lot of different directions with a lot of different uh, priorities is a good word, I mm -hmm. guess, so that I, I wouldn't call these all, all what you would say are the classical tech stocks at all. Yeah, I'm kind of surprised that Starbucks made the list. But again, this is a fairly diversified collection of companies. Starbucks probably came from Magellan, perhaps. They're not limited to technology, but technology is going to dominate this list. Yep. yep. Air products is one of those industrials that uh, probably merits a place. But there's some. I just, I just did a deep dive into my United Health Group uh, and picked up a fact that it has not had a losing quarter in 35 years. Uh, interesting, isn't it? Yeah, it's a well managed company. My sister used to work for them. Good company. In the, this dashboard, we'll follow it. Um, basically, I, I put $100 into each one as part of my effort. This is a, an example of using a dashboard to do a little bit of a, a broader study, perhaps. And we'll see how the, the 20 stocks actually perform over time. In that public link down at the bottom, you can watch along also with us. Okay. Here's a reminder that we do use, uh, archive these sessions on YouTube. Uh, the bull sessions, the round tables, any of the educational sessions that we do. Before we came on, we were talking about Sean Mason and his shorts that he's putting on. They actually show up on the bottom half of the YouTube Manifest Investing page. And with a nod to Peter Lynch and an attempt to either characterize or uh, represent the investment analysis or slash opportunity with uh, 60 seconds and a box of crayons. It's a challenge, but we're going to. We're continuing to tackle it. I think Sean is demonstrating a very fascinating area for us, and people are giving us some pretty positive feedback on them. Any thoughts on that, Ken? Uh, no, uh, I have a couple of questions before we wind up here, Mark. Uh, I, I, maybe... kept this, I kept this one in here. Let me just wrap up the slides, and then we'll okay. jump to your questions. I kept this one in here because, I don't know, I've heard from probably a dozen people that – do you know how power, you know, the, the basic premise is always, these are thousand dollar positions on the dates that are listed here, you know, basically investing a thousand dollars into these and generating this type of an amount. And the questions or observations usually come either in the flavor of, wow, I mean, these are all, you know, those single uh, round table transactions that are presented. The ones that are shaded in are actually sell, sold positions. But again, look at the, 
the number of thousands that are there. And then the flip side, which is a point that I've I've probably been forgetting to make that you generally do, Ken, that that top one, you know, people say, well, you've listed the, the best ones here, Mark. What about the ones that didn't work out? And the point that can be made is, yeah, but it takes a lot of failures to be offset by even just a single one of those positions up, up at the top. In other words, that $14,700 would offset 13 or 14 mistakes. I, we, we just have to repeat and repeat and repeat, Mark, that on a $1,000 investment, your downside is limited to $1,000. And the upside is unlimited. And so when you're, when you're putting a bet together like that, uh, you don't need a whole lot of home runs to balance out a whole bunch of strikeouts. Absolutely. And I, I am counting the days until my 72 cent investment in our Delix from the last one <laughs> makes this list. And Mark, you know, I, I hope <laughs> that it, it does because uh, that'll make this, this round table portfolio look all the more better than. Yeah, because there's, there's plenty of our Delix positions. And we'll close before we go to Q&A uh, with a fairly famous image. You recognize that, Ken? That's the Tonight Show curtain, isn't it? It is. Johnny Carson and the Mighty Karnak. It's just a nice image to close the session with, I think. In these days when, uh, as Nick DiVirgilio says, a little lightness goes a long way in these days of darkness. And I agree with you, Nick. Quickly, quickly becoming a very dated reference, Mark, you know? That, that's okay. There, there are days when I'm will, willing to admit that... Uh, these gray, these gray hairs on my, the highlighting in my hair took some time to develop. Oh, I thought you were going to say you're willing to admit you're old, just not as old as I am, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, wise, you're wise and experienced. So with that, thanks, everybody. I'll, I'll go ahead and shut down the recording. We'll stick around for some Q&A. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Ken. Mark, could you?